What's up, everyone? Thanks for joining us for another edition of the Freire and Smith podcast. It's Friday, March 22nd, and we're excited for episode 189 of the show. And today, for the first time ever, we're jumping out of the football world and into March Madness to preview James Madison and Marshall's upcoming first round games in the NCAA tournament. Kane, okay, I got to admit, you and I are both big basketball fans. And with the NCAA tournament, uh, you know, around the corner, starting later on today in the first round, I know that uh, this was the only right decision to preview a little bit of basketball on the Furry and Smith podcast. Yeah, there's no question. I love hoops, love talking hoops. And I think just for my day job now, writing about hoops the last two years has definitely added to my interest of March Madness. Hasn't added to my knowledge at all. I feel just as lost as the next guy who has watched a ton of college basketball or not any college basketball at all when filling out their brackets. But there's definitely nothing quite like March. And I'm glad we got to really tap into March with some of the Sunbelt teams that I'll be representing in the in the tournaments. Well, and Kane, let's be honest. We're all used to having our brackets busted early. Duquesne winning yesterday. There's already been a number of upsets in March Madness, but that's what we love about it. You burn your brackets uh, about 24 hours after the tournament starts, and uh, we do it all again the next year. But, Kane, I want to talk a little bit about bracket picks. I know I've got UConn winning on the men's side. They won the Big East. They have a chip on their shoulder. That that conference does after getting just three teams into the NCAA tournament. I love Dan Hurley. They won it last year, and I think they're going back-to-back. And then on the women's side, How do you pick against Caitlin Clark in Iowa? They are clearly the story this year. Caitlin Clark's been on a mission for most of this season. She's already the all-time leading scorer on both the men and the women's side. She's brought a ton of exposure. So give me Iowa winning on the women's side. Who are you taking in the tournament? It's funny, Noah. In my head going into making a bracket, I thought UConn was going to be my pick. I thought I was riding with them. But then after seeing their draw and kind of the gauntlet they have to go through having to face Auburn, I think possibly in the Sweet 16 in a tough matchup. Ended up going with Houston. I think they just have an easier road and they've been, I think, statistically one of the better teams in the country the whole year. And I know it's hard to bet against Caitlin Clark, but I am doing it. I've loved writing and covering Caitlin Clark. I think she'll go down as one of the best college athletes, male or female, when her career is all, career is all said and done. But it's a team game. And if you're going to bet against Caitlin Clark, betting for Don Staley in South Carolina is always a good choice. So I went with Houston on the men's side and South Carolina on the women's side for my brackets. Hey, I don't think those are bad picks. Obviously, you've got Houston first year in the Big 12. You've got South Carolina undefeated right now, uh, looking for a second consecutive championship. So I think those are some great picks. We'll see uh, who comes out on top at the end. And most likely, it'll be neither of us, if we're being honest. But uh, before we get to today's show, I want to tell you about our last episode. If you missed it, we ranked our top five Sunbelt football upsets over the last five years. Plus, we handed out a few honorable mentions. So in the spirit of March Madness, go back, check that episode out when you get a chance. On today's show, though, we're excited to preview the upcoming March Madness games for James Madison on the men's side, Marshall on the women's side. And we've got some special guests. We're going to be joined by Marshall head coach Kim Caldwell to talk about the Thundering Herds run as well as ESPN's Mike Morgan to discuss JMU's chances against Wisconsin and in the tournament as a whole. Cato, it's March, and everyone, including us, loves college basketball. James Madison and Marshall each have potentially winnable first-round games, in my opinion. I'm really excited to see them represent the Sun Belt in the big dance. Yeah, no, and that's what it's all about. It's about representing the Sun Belt. We obviously, in the fan bases and everyone collectively in the Sun Belt, root against each other when we're playing each other. But when it comes to teams making it to the big dance, you got to root for the Sun Belt. I'm definitely excited to watch both of these teams put their best foot forward, hopefully get a first round upset. I know both of them kind of have some momentum as far as being a trendy pick in this year's tournament. So hoping for the best for the Sun Belt as always. And just what a great way to top off an amazing season that both of these programs have already had by also getting a win to go with that in the tournament. Well, and as we've already seen in this tournament, if you pull off an upset win, the financial stakes are high as well. Increased revenue, into the league so i think sunbelt fans whether you're a fan of james madison or marshall or any other of the teams should be rooting for sunbelt teams uh to have success here in march but we're going to talk about the marshall thundering herd who will enter the ncaa tournament as a 13 seed playing against four seed virginia tech in the first round later today at 3 30 p.m eastern we were able to catch up with marshall head coach kim caldwell prior to her team's first appearance in the big dance in 27 years. Here's our conversation with the Sunbelt Coach of the Year. Well, Kim, 10 days ago, you stood courtside and watched confetti rain down inside the Pensacola Bay Center after winning a Sunbelt Conference Championship. Walk us through that moment and some of the thoughts that that elicited. Um, I think the best part was just how happy our players were. I think most of them cried, and that just is 
shows that they cared so much about it. All of their hard work paid off. And, you know, you we work really hard in this program, and there's always a chance you don't get that moment. And it really, for the majority of that game, looked like we might not get that moment. Um, but for us to finally get it, and, and they stormed the floor, and they had confetti, and they dogpiled, and they hugged, and they were so quick to put their hats and their shirts on, I just wanted to take a step back and watch it. Uh, because that's why I do this is so that they can have that moment that's going to stay with them for the rest of their lives. Well, coach, you achieved that moment and accomplished so much just less than a year into your tenure at Marshall. You've publicly called this your dream job. Could you maybe talk about what made that job so appealing and maybe what the most rewarding aspects have been so far in this first season in Huntington? Yeah, I think anytime you can be in your home state, um, especially when you have a state like West Virginia, who is very, very sports heavy, uh, women's sports heavy. They're loud. They're loyal. Um, they're going to show up and show out. And so that was important to me. I think what Brad Smith and Christian Spears are doing here at Marshall, are they're making it a very competitive job. They're making it one of the best mid-major jobs in the country. And I, was, I had heard the buzz about Marshall before I even got here. And that was one reason I was interested in it. I mean, our men were selling games out. Um, just great, great publicity. And they're doing a lot of things for sports. And so you, I wanted to be somewhere where you could win championships. And I wanted to be somewhere where we could play in front of arenas full of people. And there's a lot of women's basketball jobs where they say, hey, we could finish top half. Uh, hey, we, we get 500 people on a good night. And there's a lot of jobs like that. And that's not a job I ever wanted. I wanted a job where we could cut down this and we could do it in front of a lot of people. And I got to do it in my home state. So I think that's why Marshall is, is the dream job. And it's been so rewarding to grow those that fan base. I think when we first started, we had 300 people in the gym, and, and then we were almost to 3,000. I think had we had one more home Saturday game, we could have sold it out. I'm actually pretty positive. Had we had one more home Saturday game, we could have sold it out, which was one of our goals this year. Um, and so I, it's just been awesome to watch the team grow, but kind of watch Huntington grow around us. Yeah, I think those are such important points, and it definitely speaks to the continued growth in women's college basketball that we're also seeing nationally. But Kim, I've got to ask you, you're a year into this job. Your goal was to cut down nets at Marshall, but did you ever expect that you'd be doing it in year one? Um, I knew that the girls here, the players here were very good. I knew they were capable of doing that. Um, I had a great job at Glendale State. I loved my job. I was there for a long time. I was at my mom, alma mater, and I didn't want to take a job where I knew I was really going to have to rebuild and struggle and do all of that. Um, I had watched Marshall play. We had actually scrimmaged each other. Um, the year before, so I knew that there was talent on the roster. Did I think it would happen this quick? No, but did I think that the players on the team and the players we recruit are capable of anything? Yes. And then we hit that little skid in November, and I was thinking, oh, boy, I made a mistake. I'm not ready. Um, they're, they're resilient. They're tough. Uh, they figured it out. They bought in, and they really haven't looked back. Now, you bring a unique style of play with you from Glenville State, and I know from watching it up close and personal, I think it can be likened to the game of hockey a little bit. You've got some line changes, the high-intensity effort, and I think for our football listeners here, it's a hard scheme to prepare for, maybe similar to, say, the triple option. What are the origins of this team's style, and, and how challenging was the initial implementation slash that buy-in from this year's squad? Um, I think it was a little more challenging than I anticipated. Uh, when I took over at Glenville, they were already used to playing fast. And so here, I think I was a little bit naive in how long it would take. Um, but once they, again, once they figured it out, I think they, they went all in. But yeah, we want to make it a chaotic game. We don't want to let you run what you want to run all your practicing. And I remember when I was in college, we spent a lot of time walking through sets, almost a half hour a day walking through our sets. Well, we don't want to let you run any of those. We want to make it a full court game. Well, we want to make you do things you don't normally practice, not let the point guard set your offense up, win the possession battle, um, put body after body after body on you, come at you in waves and then grind you down. Um, and so I think that once we figured out like, hey, we are going to break teams in the second half, not the first half. Don't quit. Don't don't panic. I think once we figured that out and everyone was playing hard, uh, that's when we kind of took off. Now, we've talked about your playing days and your coaching days at Glenville State. You're a former coaching player there, and your star point guard, Abby Beeman, was also a Division II standout. They 
D2 game obviously means a lot to you. Could you maybe talk about your relationship with Abby and kind of what's allowed her to make that transition so seamlessly from D2 to D1, all culminating into her being the Sunbelt Player of the Year this year? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it is a really neat little tagline that I'm a D2 coach. Bree is a D2 player, our second leading scorer. You know, Abby, our, our best player, player of the year, she's a, D, a product of Division II. Um, and so that, that just a hats off to D2. That, that it's a really good good level. But Abby just, just really deserved it, and she has earned it, and she has gotten better and better and better. She wasn't anything last year. She wasn't first team. She wasn't second team. She wasn't third team. She wasn't newcomer of the year, anything. Um, and so for her to be able to come in this year and be player of the year, I can't think of very many people I've coached that deserve it more. Uh, she'll do anything for her team. She's in the gym all the time. She watches films. She's respectful. She loves basketball. She's all in. She can coach her teammates. And so players like her – are few and far between, and I'm happy for her. And I recruited her very, very briefly when she left Shepherd. I recruited her to try to come to Glenville. And I remember telling her, and I recruited her probably harder than I've recruited anyone. And I remember telling her I wanted to be player of the year. I wanted her to have championships. She deserves that. And she was a competitive kid, and so I think that caught her eye. And so I'm really happy that even though I said it at a different school when I was recruiting her, that I could still help her get those things because she 100% is too talented and too good to go her whole career without getting those championships and getting those accolades. Yeah, I think when you watch her play, and I got an up-close look, obviously, at the Sun Belt Tournament this year, but there's so many great elements of her game. She distributes it so well. She takes high-quality shots. But I think what stood out to me was that killer mentality on the court. Where does that come from? I have no idea. She is quiet. She is nice. She's small. So you would not really think that this animal would come out of her. But I mean, I would say the last month and a half, she has really stepped her game up. And I mean, she is taking charge. She's putting people in spots. She's barking at the opponent. She's blocking. I mean, she's doing everything and she's everywhere. And it's been fun to watch her growth. And I hope she has a really, really, really long future in basketball. Yeah, that would certainly be exciting to see. Now, there was an awesome clip that got a lot of traction, went viral, and a lot of clips do at this time of the year after you won the Sunbelt Conference Championship game, and it involved a pair of scissors that you taped to the scorer's table that day. The players touched those scissors every time they came on the court as kind of a reminder of the goal at hand that day. I've got to know, what was the origin of that idea? Now, we used to do that back in the day when we played. Um, and we always kind of liked it. And so I've been doing it for years. And it's funny, you know, you're D1, you have cameras on you all the time. And then all of a sudden it goes viral. But it, it's been something that's been a part of our program for a long time. Um, and they were good with it. I mean, they would sub themselves in and then forget. And like, oh, crap, I got to go back. Touch the scissors. Like, okay, you're already on the floor. Like, you can get them next time. But they really bought into that. And I think it helped because there were some times where it did not look good for us. And we they played hard for each other. And it's so hard to play this style of play when the ball's not going in. Because you can't really press. You don't have that adrenaline. You don't have juice. Momentum's not going your way. And so to, to get them to do that and play hard that way as they were failing was just a, a big win for me um, because I thought that they, did, they handled that great. That's definitely a cool tradition and one hopefully y'all can keep doing in Huntington in years coming forward. But as a football player in the Sunbelt, I'd won a couple Sunbelt championships and coaches and my teammates can attest to how hard it is. Winning is, is difficult. I couldn't imagine trying to do it in a sport in a season that's as long as a basketball season. That's twice as long. Could you maybe talk about how you've been able to consistently be a winner throughout your career as a player, as a coach, and maybe what the keys are to not just being a winner on the court, but maybe off the court in life as well? Yeah. I will like to go back to the scissor thing real quick. Um, we lost them. So if anyone in Pensacola has seen our scissors, we'd like to get them back. <laughs> I think we left them there. Um, but, you know, I think I approach every practice with a sense of urgency. Uh, okay, we're going to lose our next game by two points. And that's my mindset. And I go in there and I try to fix every behavior, everything. We're not shooting with our right hand on the left side. No, that's going to get blocked. We're going to lose a game doing that. We're not closing out. We're not talking. We don't have great energy. And so you go in there with a sense of urgency, like, hey, I got to fix every single thing because we're going to lose by two. And I think when I have struggled the most as a coach is when I have kind of started to pat myself on, oh, we're good. We got some talent. We're good. I can let that slide. I can let that slide. Um, I think that it's every single day you need to go all in. And there's a lot of days you don't want to, or there's a lot of days 
You don't want to hold them to a standard. You don't want to run them. You don't want to do those things because you love your kids. But at the end of the day, you want them to have that championship moment. And so you kind of remind yourself of that as well. You surround yourself with good people. You work really hard. Um, I'll be doing scouts and just tell myself, oh, I want to be done. I want to be done doing the scout. Oh, but you can't be because you just worked your team for two hours. You worked them really, really hard. They work for you. You work back for them. Make sure that you outwork your opponent too. And so we just kind of go all in. Um, yeah, a ball is life mentality. We're going to get in the gym. We're going to work hard. Uh, we're going to get in the gym extra and we're going to put every single thing we have into this. And it is tough because it's a long season. Um, and so we try to break it up a preseason, conference season, and then postseason just to kind of get little refreshes here and there. How have you seen some of the hard work and even the culture that I think you've been talking about translate off the court since taking the job at Marshall? Yeah, I think that when I first started coaching, I did exit interviews with my players and a lot of them said it's so hard. Like I just asked them for feedback on what I could do better and it's so hard and I just kind of let them keep talking but they would always finish us, but it was worth it. And I think that that is something we have learned here at Marshall is, is it is hard, but hard is worth it. We can do hard things. We can get in the gym and we can do two a days. We can get back in here. Um, it's worth it to go to bed every night or to finish every every game. We talk about having no regrets, especially at this time of year. Hey, if we don't win our next game, fine, but we're not going to have any regrets. We're going to have gone for every 50-50 ball. We're going to have ran on and off the floor. We're going to have talked. We're going to have tried our hardest. And, you know, if we go down, we're going to go down swinging, and we're not going to lose any sleep over how hard we play played, how our preparation was, how focused we were, how our energy was. And so you really just make sure that you're kind of putting it all in there. So when you do walk away from it, especially for your seniors, they can walk away satisfied. I think that's a great segue into the fact that on Sunday, you found out that you would be facing Virginia Tech in the first round, one of the country's best teams this year. They've got stars like Liz Kitley, Georgia Amor, and a deep roster. But Obviously, Kitley's health is still a big question mark uh, after she missed the ACC tournament game. Give us some insight as much as you can, obviously, into this matchup and how you think your squad stacks up against one of the ACC's best teams this year. Yeah, I mean, they're, I'm surprised that they were as low as a four seed. Um, the injury probably had a lot to do with that. I think they were top five in the country for a long time. They're tough. You know, we got to do it at their place where they're undefeated in front of 10,000 people and they gobbled all the tickets up. So it, it's definitely going to be a, a tough environment there. Um, a cool opportunity for us to go somewhere and play in front of a sold out, a real sold out environment. Uh, once in a lifetime thing. It's an incredibly hard matchup. We're going to have to play really, really well. We're going to have to hit a lot of shots. We're going to have to play hard. Um, but we talked a little bit about today about what being an underdog means and what these opportunities and these Cinderella stories and, and what all of that means. Um, and, and the opportunity that they get to have on TV to, to show what they have done all season. And, and sometimes our level is a little overlooked, but it's definitely going to be a hard game. I've learned a long time ago not to doubt this team and that they're going to give me everything that they have and they will have zero quit in them. And I'm kind of excited to see what they do on the floor because I think that they – they have a chance like we, against almost anyone when we're locked in and we're playing well. Well, Kim, we really appreciate your time today. I know this is a busy week. We appreciate you coming on and talking with Caden and I, and I know I can speak for both of us. We're excited to watch Marshall in the NCAA tournament and certainly wish you and your team the best of luck. Caden, got to love that interview. They're our first non-football guest, our first female ever on the Frary and Smith conversation or podcast rather. And after that conversation, all I've got to say is I think we need to do it more, partner. There's no question about that. I think women's basketball is just growing at an astronomical rate right now. I think there's some people, and even me a little bit, are more excited about this women's tournament than the men's tournament in some aspects. So definitely great to highlight women's sports whenever we can, especially in the month of March. And maybe something we can keep doing moving forward for sure. Yeah, Kate, and I think to your point, it has been really neat to just see the continued growth of the women's game. I, I, many people have said on TV lately, you could probably name more women's stars right now than you can on the men's side. And there's a myriad of reasons behind that. But interesting to see the continued growth of uh, women's basketball at the NCAA level. But, Caden, talking specifically about this matchup, I love it for Marshall. I touched on it in the interview. They're a unicorn because of their style of play that's tough to prepare against, similar to, as I mentioned, that triple option that you always hated uh, playing at the end of the year when Georgia Southern uh, played the Mountaineers. But, 
when you look at this Marshall team, so many weapons. You've got Abby Beeman. You've got Brianna Campbell, Aislinn Hayes, and the list really goes on and on. They don't play a lot of minutes, and they play a, a fun brand of basketball. Plus, they're facing a Virginia Tech team that we found out yesterday is going to be without their best piece in Liz Kitley. Caden, I love this matchup for the Thundering Herd and think that Virginia Tech could be on upset watch. Yeah, there's no question. We obviously want all players to stay healthy throughout their careers in college and into the tournament, but Elizabeth Kitley not playing in this game is definitely huge for Marshall. I mean, when you talk about the women's game of basketball specifically, having a six six star center who averages a double-double, taking that out of the lineup definitely makes the team and changes their dimensions and what they're working with. So definitely like Marshall's chances given that injury and given that recent breaking news. And you mentioned it, having kind of a curved ball and a change up as far as a scheme and something that a team hasn't prepared for, especially if they're preparing for that without their star player, I think definitely works in Marshall's favor. I think it's clear this team has taken kind of the identity of their head coach as well. And we see it with their play, with their offense, their energy and effort that they play with throughout the Sun Belt tournament. So really looking forward to them and this opportunity to take down potentially a Virginia Tech team that's been perennial great, perennially great in the ACC as of late. Yeah, I think it, you know, suffice to say, is a huge opportunity for a Sunbelt team to make some noise uh, here in the first round of the tournament and, and perhaps set themselves up for a, a strong run if they're able to get past that first round game against Virginia Tech. And as I said, Marshall's going to face the number four seed Virginia Tech later today. If you can't be in Blacksburg, you can watch it on ESPN2 at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. But Switching gears, Kate, into the James Madison Dukes, who enter the NCAA tournament, seated number 12 in the South region. They're going to face Big Ten member Wisconsin in the opening round on Friday, or later today, rather, at 9.40 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we were able to catch up with ESPN's Mike Morgan, who got an up-close look at James Madison during the Sunbelt Championship game. Let's get to our conversation with one of the leading voices in college basketball. Well, we're pleased to be joined by Mike Morgan, who had a front row seat to James Madison's Sunbelt tournament run that got them in the NCAA tournament. Mike, thanks for joining us in the month of March that we're sure is very busy for you. Happy to do it, Caden. Uh, great time of year. One of my favorite times of the year. I think this and the, and the start of football kind of reigns supreme. And obviously, you know, the Sunbelt has something to be awfully proud of in, in JMU. And like you said, I had a a front row ticket uh, to see the Dukes and was awfully impressed watching them really in two games. We, we watched the uh, semifinal game kind of scouting it and then talked to coaches and players and then did the Sunbelt uh, title game and came away more impressed than ever. Yeah. So you had that up close and personal look at James Madison in that Sunbelt championship run. What were your biggest takeaways you would say from your experience and just watching that team throughout the tournament? I think that, uh, you know, so often when you have a mid-major team that that has this type of year, and I mean, 31 wins is an incredible, incredible season. So, I mean, you lead the nation in victories, and I, I think the cynic in me uh, says, "Okay, let me check the non-con schedule." They well, they went to Michigan State and won in the in the season opener. They went to Kent State, not an easy place to play, and won that game in overtime. Uh, so they were battle tested enough to have a non-con that was pretty legit. And then, you know, the Sun Belt's a league I'm familiar with. I remember one of the first things I did on TV transitioning from radio was to do a Sun Belt package. And so I, I, I have a good idea, even though a lot of the teams have changed, that there's some quality basketball played in that league. And the Sun Belt as a conference has really made tremendous uh, strides. And JMU is part of that. So when you win that league, you earn it. And, and they earned it. Um, Terrence Edwards obviously gets all the glory. He's the player of the year, but, um, the, the guys that impressed me the most, quite frankly, were Bickerstaff, who is just a, a terror on both ends of the floor. Does, uh, does all the little things at a max effort and at a max productivity standpoint. And then Friedel, uh, Friedel was the best player on the floor for the semis and the championship game. Uh, if you combine those two games, no one could stop them. And I think the, you know, the, 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 the scouting report initially, if you just saw him be like, okay, he's a shooter. I got it. But what else can he do? Well, he does everything. I mean, he, he can, he can drive. He does get rebounds. He does play enough defense to be a, a factor on the floor. Uh, and then of course, in the championship game, we had Xavier Brown puts up 21 points in the first half. So they're not a one trick pony is what I'm trying to say. I th sometimes we, we see a mid-major team and we see a guy just burst onto the scene as a star. And he's a future NBA guy. And, and you're like, okay, well, that's how they got here. 
they are, they being JMU, more than just a one-trick pony. Yeah, there's no question the Dukes have plenty of offensive weapons. We saw that in the tournament. Hopefully we can see that in the NCAA tournament. But you mentioned the non-conference schedule. James Madison enters this tournament 28-3, and but they weren't really guaranteed that spot in the NCAA tournament. What's your opinion of the net rank rankings and how they're used huh. and maybe how a team that has 28-plus wins should definitely be in the big dance? I know there's a couple 20-win teams in the conference as well. How much time do we have, Caden, to talk about the net? Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm in a pretty good mood right now. You start making me talk about the net. Uh, I'm, I'm going to need to change my disposition. Now, look, the net's a guide. It, it's flawed. It's much better than the RPI was. I mean, for years and years, I would curse the RPI and, and uh, look forward to a day that we had a better metric. I do think the net is a better metric. And and JMU's met net was, was decent. But you're right. They would have had to sweat it out. Um, I don't think they get in, quite frankly, as an at-large. I think the day and age of, of getting in as an at-large in these traditional one-bid leagues, it's harder and harder. The the Power Six conferences, they know how to schedule just enough to where if they have a good year, not great, but a good year in conference, there's going to be enough uh, overall metrics to get them in on those at-large spots over your traditional uh, non, non-Power non Six uh, conferences that that typically gobble up all of those 34 at large bids. So, you know, for a league like the Sun Belt, again, fair or unfair, it's it's almost always going to be a one bid league. Like I think back to when Eustachy had a Southern Miss team in Conference USA that got an at large. You know, that those days are almost done. Your 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 non con just has to be incredibly impressive to pull that off these days. The one good thing about that, and I don't think the Sunbelt hierarchy would appreciate this too much because it's all about getting as many teams in as you can, and I don't blame them. But working the Sunbelt Championship, as I do every year, I love it because it's a true do or die, right? Either you're going to be uh, heartbroken or your dreams are going to are going to happen right on that stage. It all comes down to those 40 minutes. And I think that's what makes Champ Week so special. With all due respect to the other conference tournaments, uh, there's nothing that beats a do or die. You either win it to get in it, or you lose and you go home. And the Sun Belt uh, certainly falls under that category. And I think JMU, probably, fair or unfairly, would have fallen prey to that uh, had they lost that championship game to Arkansas State. Well, as an App State alum, I was definitely hurt to see us get bumped from the tournament because I know that's mm-hmm. kind of the reality yeah. of these kind of tournaments for a conference like the Sun Belt. You're not going to make it to that March Madness unless you're able to win your conference championship. But you mentioned your familiarity with the Sun Belt. You've obviously covered this championship year after year after year. You've seen a lot of basketball. What are some areas maybe you'd like to see the Sun Belt continue to grow as they push to potentially maybe become a two big lead, bid league in the future? Or is it maybe just kind of too too improbable and too hard to happen? Well, first off, I love the additions they've made. Like, I, I think, what, what is it up to now? 16 uh, teams or, or is it 18? I, uh, something. So I, I think the they're not just adding teams to add raw numbers. They're adding programs that truly fit and can offer something in, in all the major sports. So, I, I mean, I love the additions that this league has made. You know, you think of a Marshall who pulled off an NCAA tournament upset not long ago. Uh, and, and in the Sun Belt now, and, and JMU in the Sun Belt, and I mean, there's just been a number of really good additions to this league. So I think they're 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 making all the right moves. The only way you're going to get in as an at large, you're going to have to schedule uh, more heavyweights. And look, that's a two way street. Sometimes you pick up the phone. I talk to coaches all the time. They're like, Mike, we'll, we'll play anybody, but the team, the Power Six team, has to agree to do it. And, of course, it almost always has to be on their terms, not yours. You have to go there. Rarely will they come to you. The fact that App State hosted Auburn this year, that's, uh, that is a rare exception. The fact that Bruce Pearl agreed to do that, and kudos to him for doing it. Obviously, uh, it was a tough loss for Auburn, but it didn't kill them. They're in the NCAA tournament. They just won the SEC championship. I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more of schools like – like a JMU or a Marshall or an App State getting to host an SEC team and, and, and provide more unique matchups like that. But that's the only way you do it. You, you have to schedule almost a murderer's row 
which means you're going to take a beating. You know, you're going to lose more often than not in those games. But if you pull off a couple of upsets like JMU did against uh, Michigan State, then maybe that turns into just enough in the metrics where in a given year you could become a two-bid league. But it's it's going to be really hard. One thing I will say is that the portal, the portal certainly favors the power six in that if you recruit just a stud player and you develop him and he turns into, you know, an all-American type talent, he's going to be gobbled up with NIL money uh, in the portal. But it works two ways because if you look at the, the teams like JMU and others, they're getting kids out of the portal from power six schools that for whatever reason, it did not work out. But these are, you know, ESPN top 100 recruits very often that come to your campus and they wind up being a big factor. So uh, the portal is actually in some cases helped a, a, a league like the Sun Belt because you're able to find guys that still have that top end potential, but for whatever reason, it was not working out in a league like the SEC or the Big 12 or the ACC. And you look at all the transfers that a program like JMU or some other in the Sunbelt had, and they've been able to take advantage of it. Yeah, there's no question a lot of the narrative around the transfer portal is obviously focused on football, but I think the future with basketball, especially for conferences like the Sun Belt, is definitely going to be very bright and interesting to watch as these rosters get built out in the offseason. But pivoting back to James Madison, let's talk about head coach Mark Byington. He's been absolutely incredible. He's inherited a last place team in the CAA that he's led to a regular season title in 2021. He's had back to back 20 plus win seasons now for the Dukes, and now they're headed to the NCAA tournament. What's impressed you the most about him and his interactions he's had with you? Yeah, I mean, we had a we had a good talk with him after the semifinal win. You know, because of the the format and the time. And remember, you got the women's game the same day as the men's game at the same gym. So we don't we don't get to go to shoot around the day of the game. Very often, they don't even have it. Uh, so we talked to the coaches right after the the win the day before in the semifinals. And it's a little bit unique for us, but he was terrific with us. He's very impressive. I mean, I looked at his track record going all the way back to college at Charleston and working under Kremens. And what I love about his story and what I love about a lot of these stories, these guys are grinders. Like they, They've been given nothing. These aren't like former NBA players. They're like, yeah, I feel like I want to coach today. Uh, give me a job because I'm a big name. No, 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 no. Guys like Mark Byington, uh, they know what it's like to coach at the low levels and have to turn the lights out and wipe the floors and do all the things to to help improve their status and go from job to job to job. And that's what he's done. Uh, look, JMU, if they pull off an upset, which is a very popular pick as a 12 seed, uh, he's going to be getting some job offers. So then the challenge becomes, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You do everything you can to find that coach that can get you over the hump. And then when he does and he puts your program on the map, well, now everybody wants to take him away. That's just the nature of being a mid-major. But I, I think that he's he's a good one. And if JMU can keep him around, you're going to watch JMU win a lot more games and probably a lot more Sunbelt championships. Uh, but make no mistake about it, he's he's on a lot of people's radar right now. Yeah, it's just the world of college sports that we're in now. It's hard to keep players at these mid-majors. It's hard to keep coaches as well. So it'll definitely be interesting to see what the future of James Madison looks like. But there's no question that I think his team has kind of embodied that grittiness that he has as a head coach. You talk about players like Terrence Edwards. We talked about Noah Friedel, who's impressed you, TJ Bickerstaff. Offensively, this team is awesome. What did you would you say has led to their offensive success that we've seen this year and what you've been able to watch with your own eyes? I just think they're a great all-around team. Like Sometimes you run into these teams – like I had, uh, I, as you probably know, I do a ton of SEC games, and every now and then I'll uh, venture outward. So before the Sun Belt, I had a one-off uh, at um, Sanford, Buckyball, which is the other story. Like I saw the two teams that everybody's picking as an upset uh, in, in the field. I had them in person. I, I had Sanford in a home game and I got to learn a lot about Bucky McMillan and Bucky ball. And then of course I had, you know, JMU. Uh, and, and so when you, when you look at those, you know, types of teams, they all do it in unique ways. So Sanford is, we're going to press for 40 minutes and we're going to launch a ton of threes and we're going to play 10, 11 guys. Well, that's not JMU. JMU is just a good all around team. They just do everything. Well, they don't, they don't focus specifically on one thing. They're not like a team that shoots 
a ton of threes and they're not a team that presses a whole lot. They're just really good. They're just they're just really good at playing fundamental basketball. You've got a number of different players that on any given night can be the star. Bickerstaff can be the star uh, on a night. Obviously, Terrence Edwards, the player of the year, can be a star. Friedel can be a star. In our game, Brown was a star. Julian Wooden, to me, is the ultimate glue guy. He doesn't get enough uh, talk. So they, they just have a lot of different ingredients, unlike a lot of mid-major teams that have success. Again, it's down to one or two players. I'm impressed with their overall body of work with four or five guys that can all do different things to help win you big games. Kane, I appreciate you taking the lead on that interview with Mike there. And I found it particularly interesting after listening back to it, his thoughts on the the growth trajectory of the Sun Belt and even the offensive game for James Madison that he clearly really liked. Yeah, there's no question that Mike's a savant of the Sun Belt Conference when it comes to basketball. is very familiar with it. And it was interesting talking to him about the growth of this conference potentially and what they could do in the future to maybe get a couple more teams in the tournament. It's not easy given the current format, but we've seen some of the conversations with the expansion of the college football playoff that maybe this NCAA tournament could get bigger as far as the field goals in the future field goes in the future so we'll be very interested to see if in the future if we have a couple more 20 win teams 20 plus win teams like we had last season that maybe changes this in the in the future when we look at some more Sunbelt teams getting more respect around the country and getting into the tournament it's very similar to football I think this conference when you look at basketball and football is on the rise the people who really know ball kind of respect what's going down but when when it comes to the national decisions that are being made and the placements for the postseason it would be great to see some change but I think this James Madison team if they're able to get this win if they're able to put their offense on display in a national stage would definitely help for the conference moving forward I think yeah I would agree with you I think playing well in March can lead to other teams getting opportunities in the future I think you could argue that the Sun Belt had an outside chance at at being a two-bid league this year had App State won in the conference tournament Uh, instead they lose James Madison ends up winning which now leads to a a one-bid league and we saw App State play a very good game uh, in that loss to Wake Forest in the, the first round of the NIT. But, Caden, much like the Marshall-Virginia Tech matchup, I'm excited about this matchup for James Madison. They've already proven that they can take down a Big Ten team. They were able to take down Michigan State, who was ranked number three at the time in the country. Michigan State also pulling off an upset already in this tournament. Uh, they can flat-out score the rock, which I think is important come this time of year. Uh, We mentioned Terrence Edwards, Noah Friedel, TJ Bickerstaff. They've got a a ton of elite weapons, particularly from the outside, uh, where they were the Sun Belt's best three-point shooting team. And the reason I mention that is Wisconsin was amongst the worst teams defensively against the three-point ball this year in the NCAA. And, Caden, I'm one of those people who thinks that this is a good matchup for James Madison and that they could make some real noise in the NCAA tournament if they're able to get past the first round. Yeah, no, I think when you look at the entire tournament field, there's no teams that are kind of polar opposites as much as Wisconsin and James Madison when you look at first round matchups. So really excited for this game to see the contrast of styles and to see which style kind of takes precedent and wins. I think when you talk about today's game of basketball, favoring that three point shot and the ability to score is kind of what we've seen be more successful as of late. And James Madison clearly has that. You mentioned the three offensive weapons. They have kind of a three headed monster that carried them through the Sunbelt tournament. Always good to have that heading into the NCAA tournament just because you never know what kind of defensive matchups are going to work in your favor. And having more than one primary scoring option definitely works out great. So James Madison's a team I definitely like in this matchup and even in their next matchup against Duke if that's who they end up drawing. So I think they're built for tournament basketball. I think they're specifically kind of built well for their side of the bracket specifically and really looking forward to not just this matchup, but if they do win, maybe making a run. I know some people have kind of talked about a sweet 16, maybe making it even further than this first round. So definitely excited for the Dukes here coming up. Hey, sign me up for a potential Duke versus Dukes matchup in round two. I think that would be uh, a fun storyline there if Mark Byington's squad is able to uh, get past Wisconsin in the first round later on today. The Dukes will take on fifth-seeded Wisconsin later tonight. If you can't make it up to Brooklyn, you can watch the game on CBS beginning at 9.40 p.m. Eastern. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode. We hope you all enjoyed our March Madness preview. Before you go, don't forget, we'll be back again on Tuesday. We've got an exciting episode planned that you'll want to make time to join us for. That'll do it for us here at the Prairie and Smith Podcast. Before you go, here's all that we ask. Tell a friend about the Prairie and Smith Podcast. Help us help you by continuing to grow the show into the top place 
for Sunbelt football fans. So for Caden Smith, Richmond Weaver, and Brett Jamis, I'm Noah Freire. We really appreciate you spending time with us today. We'll talk to you again on Tuesday. Thank you.